All right, it is that time once again. The round of 16, the Sweet 16 is upon us here, and that means here at Osmo, we are ready to talk some college hoops. I am Ben Raza. I am joined, as I always am, by Matt Gajewski, and we've got a ton to get to. We've got four fantastic Thursday games. We're going to get into all that from DFS to betting, and of course, we're going to talk about our sponsor, Prize Picks, powering the show. If you have not been over there, absolutely fantastic time. To get over and try it out, you can use the promo code AWESOMO and get up to a deposit bonus up to $100. You can sign up on the App Store. But what you're doing over there is you are picking over or under projected props, whether it's points, whether it's rebounds, fantasy score, three-pointers made. And the great thing is that the tools that we have on the AWESOMO site allow you to see the projections that Matt and the entire team has created. So we have a ton of opportunities there. We're going to be giving you some of our favorites throughout the show. but We've got four big games to get to. I'm going to start with the Arkansas side real quick. Them and Gonzaga, big time matchup here in the first game. And let's dive into Arkansas's personnel. Eh, it's going to be an interesting. They're a sizable dog here. They've got a couple alphas if they can stay out of foul trouble. And I'll start with Jalen Williams, who's a guy I could see him playing upwards of 40 minutes tonight again if he can stay on the court. He played 40 minutes against New Mexico State. They've got JT Note. As well, these guys are both priced in that 7K range. No problem getting there, Matt. And I know that when you look at what we're doing here, Arkansas is a team that we're going to want to potentially get a lot of exposure of. You've got some salary savers with Tony and Davis. You've got Williams and Note. So those are the guys I think you can go to uh, for the Arkansas side. But on the Gonzaga side, Timmy brought them back against Memphis. He was absolutely outstanding in that second half. You've got him. You mentioned Chet, of course, as a premier play every time they take the floor. So do you pay up on a four-game slate for one of these guys? Can you play them together? Is that too much salary? What do you do with the Zags tonight? You have to play one, and I think you can play both. They do cannibalize each other a little bit because they're both front court players. So if one of them gets in foul trouble, the other one directly benefits. However, they both will play over 30 minutes in competitive games, and Timmy in particular has been a monster of late. At his price, which is AK, he's 700 cheaper than Chet. He's the much better price-adjusted play. And he's extremely involved in almost every category. 24% shot rate, 27% rebound rate. And he also is active in the periphery. Chet doesn't shoot the ball as much, so he's a little more reliant on stats like blocks, which are more volatile for DFS. But they also give you an immense ceiling. So I'm comfortable with both. Preference towards Timmy in cash builds. And everybody else that starts is a GPP play. Nemhard is too expensive when you can just pay 400 extra for Timmy. I'm going to make that all day. And then Strother and Bolton are just wind sprinters attached to a team with a really high total. If for whatever reason they get hot from beyond the arc or something, they could end up in the optimal lineup, but neither are strong plays based on their very, very weak rates. Would you put Watson behind a guy like Tony on the other side for value? I would not. He's too expensive. He's more expensive than the Arkansas value and some other guys will play on the slate. Plus, he doesn't access the ceiling unless it's a blowout. There you go. I mean, obviously, Gonzaga, they've got those high-end guys. I think they're going to win pretty comfortably tonight. I'm not really looking to lay near nine and a half. And if you want our betting picks, sign up for the package. Premium betting in the description or head over to Odd Shopper. Matt put out a nice little preview. Totally free. Video is Posted. All right, one down, three to go. Michigan, Villanova, Jawan Howard, Jay Wright. It's got it all. Dickinson, of course, leads this Wolverine team. Knocked off Tennessee. That is an impressive win, no doubt. So let's start there. What is the status? Because every time we've seen them, only been a couple games, they've had some uh, point guard issues. Devontae Jones missed the first game, then he came back, then he got hurt. Is he going to play tonight? And do you think he will play without limitations? Yeah, he's been practicing in full, so Devontae should be fine. There's a little bit of an issue, though. Like, Frankie Collins has just outplayed him in two straight games now. Frankie Collins has shown a lot more than Devontae showed over the course of the year. Again, small sample with Frankie, but my concern is do they rotate these guys a little more than normal, or do they just let Devontae go back to the 35 minutes he was playing previously? I honestly think Juwan Howard is going to play Devontae 35 minutes, but that's at least a concern. And this Michigan team, they're going to be struggling, I think, if they try to use like Dickinson and some of these bigger guys like Diabate stands out 
in perimeter defense. They, they can't defend Villanova like they defended these other Big Ten teams. Villanova's just not composed the same way. And it's funny, Hunter Dickinson compared this Villanova team to like a, I don't know, an Iowa squad. I don't know exactly what he said, but he compared them to Iowa, which is just laughable. I don't think he's ever watched Villanova play this year. So I don't know. A lot of concerns with Michigan, especially defensively. Another spot where I don't think I want to lay the points just because each of these teams has strengths and weaknesses. Villanova is very poor defending the interior. They don't have any size. They don't have any rebounding. Dickinson and Diabate take advantage of that. And conversely, Villanova is an amazing shooting team. They take a ton of threes. They shoot them really well. That's a weakness for Michigan with their guard defense. So I actually kind of like the over at 135. We saw a similar matchup between Nova and Ohio State play towards the over. So I think that's somewhere you can look. For DFS, Michigan easily has the lowest implied team total on the slate. So I don't want to play any of these guys. Dickinson's more expensive than Timmy. Just absolutely ridiculous. Outside of the largest GPPs, you're never doing that. Brooks has been handling a lot of points, so his stats look a lot better than they did over the course of the year, but that should go right back to Devontae Jones, Eli Brooks going back to more of that shooting guard position. Houston's really cheap. Caleb Houston, he's 4.9K, but he still projects a little bit worse than some of the other value in the slate, primarily the Arkansas players. I'm kind of off this Michigan team altogether for DFS outside of massive tournaments. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Iowa, uh, I don't really he see said, that Did at you all. see that? Not, I mean, the first thing, Villanova plays extremely slow. They're a methodical offense. I was, I don't know where it, the common thread is. They could shoot a lot of threes. Could those teams be any more different? Iowa yeah. plays fast, horrible defense through a big man. Villanova plays slow, solid defense through premier guard play. Yeah, I mean, Villanova spreads you out. They don't miss free throws. Uh, I don't see that comparison at all. But what we do know is that Villanova, uh, doesn't really have a front court and, and they can survive because they've got so many guys that can shoot threes. They've got an all world point guard. They're the number one free throw shooting team in the country. They do a lot of the little things good. They don't really turn it over as much. And again, they play at a very slow tempo. So what does that mean for the DFS side? You, you've got a lot of guys hovering in that five or six K range. They don't have that alpha. Does that make them more appealing or less appealing? Less appealing overall. Their prices are okay, so it's not like you're way overpaying for these guys, but it's a limited ceiling situation. So I think you're putting maximum one in your lineup and then deciding between them is kind of difficult. Gillespie's been extremely involved lately. He's their main ball handler, so he has a, a lot of peripheral upside with assists. Justin Moore is a strong buy low. He's the highest usage rate on the team, but he hasn't performed very well lately. Shot rate's still 23%. So if you want to buy low on a player on Nova, it's more. And I think he's probably my favorite play overall. You can also target Jermaine Samuels. They don't have a lot of size in the front court, but he's going to be one of the main players they use down there. 26% rebound rate. So he's the player that gives you the most double-double equity. Again, bad matchup against that Michigan front court. But Samuels has been playing a ton of minutes recently, too. So I think he's probably the cheapest guy I'd like to use. Caleb Daniels has played 30 minutes in three straight, but he's mainly just a shooter. Anything with, like, Dixon? You could. I, I think he's just a little more volatile. The rates aren't good for Dixon. He's mainly just a rebounder. His minutes have come up during the tournament. Um, I'm not sure if that's because that they are missing a, a rotational player uh, yeah, and he's out again in terms of Long Gino uh, or whatnot, or it doesn't really matter there. I'll, I'll give a quick shout out to Conor Gillespie's three point prop on prize picks. It's over two and a half. That's where it's been. He hasn't been really shooting well, but he takes a ton of them. He's taken eight, nine, and nine uh, in the last couple games. He's going to be very, very active. Uh, if you're going to give me close to 10 three point attempts, I'll live with that and think that he can push over that, even in a game. That's not going to be super high tempo, but you mentioned you might lean to the over. I could see this being a, you know, a somewhat decent output in terms of both offenses. Yeah, it comes down to efficiency. Villanova has a strong advantage on the perimeter. Michigan has a strong advantage on the interior, and that's what both of the offenses want to do. So as long as they play to the efficiency we've seen all year, I think it goes over. I think uh, Ken Palm had this over too. I have this in front of me. I'll double check. Yeah, they have it 137. So just there you go. a little point towards the over. There are some things that that do have me interested in that. I haven't put it on my personal card, but we, we'll take a look uh, as we get closer to tip here. Two down, two to go. Texas Tech and Duke, big time game. Red Raiders, slight favorite, basically a pick em. I've seen them at one point favorite, 137 and a half. Extreme defense. They looked good. They got into it a little with Notre Dame, but they clamped down late. They run so many guys, though. 
does that make it tough for you to get to them? Or again, is it pick your 5K guy and move on? Do you have a favorite amongst these guys? Texas Tech doesn't have anybody above 6K on DraftKings. So I think that stands out immediately. If you want to play one, you're not spending a lot of your salary. So I think it's viable. I think it's basically just Kevin McCullough or you move on. He's their best player. His usage has been down, not just in their last three games, but on the season because of injuries. He's been hurt repeatedly. But he's now played 30-plus minutes in two of their last three games. The one where he did not was the slaughtering of Montana State. So nothing to see there. He's going to be the guy you get to on this team. I'm not really trying to get to Kevin O'Banner. I think some people will try to play him. He's more expensive than McCullough. He's a guy that's played very well in their first two games, but again, against Montana State and then against a Notre Dame team that doesn't have any size. O'Banner's only 6'8", and now he's going to be trying to bang with Bancaro and Mark Williams, who are 6'10 and 7 feet, respectively. Kevin O'Banner is a guy that really struggled during conference play against some of the bigs in, in the Big 12. So I think it's just a little bit of recency bias and people that don't pay attention to college basketball all season long that are maybe a little bit enticed by O'Banner here. Plus, you have Rothstein tweeting how good his rebounding is, which just isn't true. So I think McCuller or bust for Texas Tech. Big bodies this morning. Yeah, I mean, poor old, former Oral Roberts, great. I, I want to ask you specifically about that number, though. On prize picks, his over-under for rebounds is six. Do you have a lean there, or is that about spot on? I'll check. My first lean is under, but he projects right at six for me. Nothing to see here. Yeah, I think more so I wanted to bring that up, not because it's a great play, but I think if people are hunting around box scores, you you accurately predicted, you see, oh, man, this guy's got a double-double in both games, 11 and 15 rebounds. This is only six. This is an easy over. It's absolutely not. You mentioned the interior of what they've played versus what they're going to see tonight with Duke. Totally different. This is not a high... You know, this is not Jalen Williams and some of these other guys with massive rebounding rates. So I, I want to caution people there. I don't see any value as well. Very quickly, do you see anything with Arms or Williams or these guys? Or is it, as you mentioned, just not the right Red Raider? I think Arms is a GPP play, but his minutes have come down since we've gotten Terry Shannon and McCuller back. He doesn't play as consistent of minutes as even McCuller. So I would rather just save the 500, go down and, and get McCuller. Yeah, you mentioned Texas Tech's played. Uh, walking wounded a lot this year. On the other side, I always like to ask you this. You've got Paolo in between Chet and Timmy in pricing. Where does he fall on that 8K priority list? He's a little lower. So this game has the second worst total, but it's a close spread. So Duke and Texas Tech have the second worst and the third worst implied team totals on the slate. Duke is the second worst. So you can get access to a larger team total with an underdog like Arkansas compared to Duke. So Paulo has amazing rates. He's above 20% in every major statistical category, but for things like cash, he's going to be a little bit behind the other elite plays. With that said, for tournaments, completely viable because of the rates we just mentioned. He's extremely involved. It's just the game environment's a little bit worse. And even though Paulo does have size advantages against Texas Tech, they are the number two defense in the country for a reason. They're not going to give up anything easy to him. Roach, uh, their guard, who's at flat 5K, he's coming up $100 at a time. He's playing a <laughs> massive amount of minutes. Is that someone that you could go to, or do you think that you're going to try to stick to the front court mainly with Duke? I think Roach is viable. With him, it's just a price thing. It's He doesn't need to have great rates at that price, and he certainly doesn't. I still prefer the Arkansas players if you're playing just one or two values, but if you're going a full stars and scrubs, Roach firmly in play might end up playing him in cash myself. That's how solid the price is. As far as the other guys, Wendell's just ceding too much usage to Paulo and Mark right now. All of his rates, the good rates that he had, were early in the season. They've since shifted. Mark is playing a ton of minutes recently, 30 and 32 in their last two games. Huge rebounding rate. If he plays 30 minutes again, he's a walking double-double. He might be forced into more minutes. AJ Griffin's nursing a lower body injury. It looked like an ankle, only 23 minutes in their last game. I think he's going to play. He looked pretty good in the post game, looked pretty good in practice. So I'm expecting AJ out there, but you never know if he's limited. And Keels, he's now playing the Jeremy Roach role. They just flipped. Keels is mid-25s in minutes. He's more expensive than Roach. I think you just play Roach instead. And there is really no one else, correct? Like, they only play six for... guys. Exactly. Theo John's going to play 10 minutes a game, but he's going to fall three times. Ah, uh, Theo John. Yeah. No, it's an easy team to break down in that regard. There's not a deep rotation. 
uh, foul trouble, they have to kind of play through it. They have no choice. It's a North Carolina-esque situation there, unlike Texas Tech, who will be running literally waves uh, of guys out there. Any lean on the game, to me, it's a true coin flip. I'm not betting it. I bet Duke. I am going to stick with that. I think outside of the size, they just match up really well against Texas Tech. Texas Tech's a team that relies a lot on turnovers. They're 16th in the country in turnovers generated on defense. Luckily, Duke has multiple ball handlers. So if one of them gets in foul trouble or something, that's not really going to be an issue. And then they have the 21st fewest turnovers in the country in offense. So that's a fantastic matchup there. Conversely, Texas Tech will turn the ball over in offense. Duke is great at forcing them. Duke is not a team that fouls a lot, but they generate a ton of them. We've seen some of the guys in the front court for Texas Tech foul a bunch. If Santo Silva or O'Banner get in foul trouble, it's just going to exacerbate problems they already have. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that Duke presents challenges that Texas Tech hasn't seen in the tournament. You know, they play a lot of, of course, really good competition in their conference, but I am interested to see that. But for me, the game, if I could watch one game, if I could see one game, it would be the last game. And again, if you're hopping in, you want to support us. We're going to be doing the show every day. So stay tuned. Of course, we've got you covered from the betting side on Odd Chopper to the DFS side right here on the Awesome channel. Support us, subscribe, do what you do. And if you want to join the community, it is in the description. There's no better time. It's a really good group of people in there talking sports, giving bets, Alex Baker and the whole team. Uh, it is a great, great time. But we've got Houston, the team that I definitely have lost the most money on this year. <laughs> Maybe besides Texas, uh, playing Arizona, it's maybe I'm wrong, and I know that Ken Palm and a lot of metrics love Houston. It's only a one and a half point spread. I am gonna fall right into that trap. I'll get right to it. I like Arizona in this game. At some point, maybe it'll be when they're cutting down the nets and they'll wish they had Sasser to, to clip the last one because they seem unaffected by the injuries. Houston is just a buzzsaw. But how are they gonna go about dealing with this? with who they have left on the court. Yeah, Houston moved up to number two in the country in terms of Ken Palm. What's going on? They're favored on Ken Palm in this game. And I think there's a lot of reasons why. I took Houston at the plus two, so it's moved a little bit. I am not sold entirely. I took this because I thought it would move. I may hedge out, and I'll explain why. You mentioned a couple of reasons. The depth is a huge issue for Houston if there's foul trouble at any point in time. That's really going to test them. They foul a decent amount. Arizona is top 50 in the country at drawing fouls. So that is an advantage right away. The other thing is Arizona has going for them is the athletic bigs they possess. They're number one in the country in effective height, number three in rebounding. Houston's 95th in height. They just send so many guys at the boards that they've still managed to remain 18th in the country. The only concern I have here with Arizona is they just changed their rotation. They sent two ballots to the bench. He's played horribly since coming back from the injury. So they're not running the same lineup that was this, this number one team in terms of effective height. So I don't know, like, that kind of erases one of their biggest matchups. They do have the seven-footer in Colico, but now they're using essentially, like, just guards and combo guards with Tubelis off the floor. And Omar Balo certainly isn't the player that Tubelis is. So I don't know what they're doing with their rotation. Kirk Kreese is still hurt. He played limited minutes in an overtime game. We saw him at 27. That game played, you know, above 40 against TCU. So how effective is he? He played terribly in that contest as well. I don't know. The advantages that Arizona does have, I think, are mitigated a little bit by not only the injury, but just coaching decisions. Like, what do you make of that? So I don't really – I'm with you. I don't fully understand exactly what they're doing. I'll say this. Creasa can't play any worse. So he was one for 10 from three. <laughs> Uh, there's really nothing that could happen there except them making the move to Kyer if he's that bad once again. But you've got a guy like Terry who's not coming off the floor. Obviously, you've got Matt Theron. I think that you already alluded to why I think Arizona is going to win. I think the front court depth, I was not thrilled with what Illinois did against Houston. Part of that was what Houston did to them. But I thought that it should have been Chattanooga-esque where Kofi was putting tremendous strain on Carlton and White. And I think tonight... We're going to see that. And I don't know what Houston's really going to do. Yes, they could have Edwards go nuts and she knows what he's doing. But Arizona is going to put a lot of strain. And I think they will dictate tempo as well. If the game goes over and there's a lot of fouls, you mentioned Arizona draws a ton of them. I worry about exactly what Houston's going to do there. Now on the DFS side, 
do you go to someone like Edwards or Moore or these guys, or are you just saying uh, it's a tough spot, even though they do get the pace up with Arizona? Yeah, you definitely want to target some Houston guys. They don't they don't rotate anyone in off the bench. The total is no. 145. You mentioned the pace. I think that's a lot of the reason why. Arizona plays extremely fast. Houston's well below average, but that's not going to matter against Arizona. They are going to get paced up. Kyler Edwards is phenomenal. He's above 23% in all major statistical categories. Last three, played at least 37 minutes and three straight. Love him. Sheet is a great play too, 6,500. He's played 37, 34, and 31 minutes. He'll be their main ball handler. A little less double-double equity, but his assist rate is up near 33% last three. Great play there. And Taze Moore is kind of smashed in between them. He's active across the board, but his rates just leave, you know, a little bit to be desired compared to the other two. Shot rate, not quite as good as Edwards. Rebound rate, a little less than a guy like Fabian White. Assist rate, below Sheed. So he's just... If you find yourself in that price range, I'm okay with him, but I would rather go up to Edwards or down to Sheed if that's where you end up. Now, Fabian White is a guy who got injured in the conference tournament. He has a back injury. He hasn't played more than 29 minutes in three straight games, which, which is fine. 29 minutes out of Fabian White is a little more palatable at his price today than previously in the tournament, but I think they end up needing him against the size of the front court as long as Tabellus isn't playing 15 minutes again. So he might be a buy low in tournaments you could target. Not really trying to get to Carlton. His max is like 24 minutes a game. He'll rotate in with Cheney and some of the other players in their front court. So it's basically Edward Sheed and Moore, I think, top plays on Houston. On the Arizona side, you mentioned uh, the Tabellus situation. Larson's playing more. But I want to ask you about Creases specifically. Do you think he revs back up to mid thirties tonight? Or do you think that Kyer will still carve out, you know, he started and didn't really do much. Where, where do you think that goes? Or do you think it shifts back to what it was the whole year? I think more time away from the injury is always going to be better. How much it affects them. I'm not sure because that game against TCU was hyper competitive and crease. It could only get 27 minutes on the floor played terribly in that time as well. So I expect that they probably rested him a lot this week, probably got in some time, you know, and shoot around, stuff like that. But his ankle injury was pretty bad. So Creesa, I think, is risky. The, the issue is with him is he's so cheap that you almost are forced into playing him. The game environment is so solid, and we're just outside of the Arkansas players. You have to find another value play. Creesa might just end up being the guy because of his role on an explosive offense with this total. Outside of him, I think you definitely want to target Mathurin. 7,500, still way too cheap for a guy with a 28% shot rate, 19.5% assist rate, and he gets a little bit on the glass, too. Colico, he's played a ton recently, nearly a 30% rebound rate. I don't expect that to change. It's just, do it, does he get into foul trouble, and do we have to see more Tubelis? I have no idea what to make of Tubelis at this point. 16 minutes and 20 minutes in their last two games. You can play him in tournaments. We've seen the ceiling. It's He has immense double-double potential. It's just... I don't know what the team is doing with him right now. And you mentioned Terry. He's kind of a wind sprinter, more of a peripheral player, but he's sort of this glue guy that you could use in the mid-5Ks because he's going to play 36-plus minutes. You still can't go to Balo? I don't think so. He's, <laughs> he's been below 20 minutes in two straight games, even with Tabellis playing horribly. Yeah, it's funny you say that because like it really hasn't impacted – his minutes, it's been dispersed more to combo guards, not another big, which is just kind of a different philosophy. I, I want to ask you real quick before it bounces out of here, Coloco specifically, where do you have his rebounding number projected at? Because over on prize picks, it's at, uh, let's see, I, I had it just now. It's at eight on the dot. Do you lean over there? He's been doing some serious work on the boards. 9.6, and yeah. that's with a 33-minute projection, which he's been above that or above 30 minutes, I should say, very consistently of late. He was a mid-25-minute player previously this year when Tabellus was playing well, but since Tabellus' struggles, Colico has been playing a lot more. So I think the rebounding prop could be something you look towards the over here. Yeah, I would agree. If he stays out of foul trouble, I think he, he hits that number pretty comfortably. Uh, and even if he does get in a little foul trouble, we could be just fine. All right, four up, four down. Any final thoughts before we put a bow on this Thursday slate? Again, we will have the same four-game breakdown for Friday's batch of games here in the Osmo Network. But any final thoughts on these four? Yeah, we only have four games, so I would say start being a little more cognizant of ownership on these slates. They're not the massive slates we saw last weekend. 
So players like Drew Timmy are going to be extremely owned. The cheap Arkansas players, Tony and Devo Davis are going to be extremely owned. And there's pivots one for one off of them. Maybe you play a unique lineup that has Chet or Nemhard instead of one of the players. And that is a tournament specific idea. But in your contest, start thinking about only having four games and where the field is going to be. There it is. Any questions at jazzrazdfs at, at Matt underscore Gajeski. We love the comments. We love the feedback and we love the support on the videos. Hit that like button on your way out. Thanks to Prize Picks for sponsoring this show. Hope to see you guys in Discord. Thanks to Mike Behind the Glass hanging out with us this morning to post this video. But for me, for Matt, for Mike, for everyone here at Osmo, good luck. Enjoy the Thursday night games and we will talk to you guys soon.